All right, everybody. Did you get my email yesterday with a little video? All right. So the uh, there's no great complexity to starting to put water through the network once you've specified like a reservoir and a pipe and a junction. You just set up the demand collection, and then you can start to see what's the effect of uh, of a withdrawal from your pipe network. Of course, that last question, number 11, that's optional anyway. But in case you want to start to glimpse at what the full, the, the full range of um, uh, possibilities are with water gems, you can give that a try. OK, uh, so let's look a little bit into the future here. On Thursday, you've got both uh, an assignment due and our first midterm exam. So I'm going to provide an equation sheet for you. Um, the exam will be 75 minutes long. I haven't written it yet, so I can't tell you what's on it. But even if I had, I wouldn't tell you what's on it. <laughs> so I guess it really doesn't matter. Uh, it's going to cover everything up through and including today's class and including the assignment that you're turning in on Thursday. Now, um, if, if there's anything on that homework assignment uh, 3C that you're not 100% clear on, send me an email. Of course, uh, are the answers in the back of the book for some of them? It's like the evens, maybe. Yeah, so uh, most of these are evens. It, you know, if, if there's one that you want to, if you're not certain about, you can stop by my office or uh, send me an email. I'm glad to tell you if you've got the right answer or the wrong answer, since you're not going to have a chance to get this back before the exam. You know, it, it's being collected the same day as the exam. You kind of want to just further clarify whether you have that or not. Please let me help you. Um, we're going to talk about stability of floating bodies today uh, after we do one last buoyancy related problem. Before we do that, are there any questions related to the announcements? All right. Um, let's just make sure that we're on the same page with looking at things from different views. Um, and I ask this because uh, in a previous semester, I gave an exam question for a flat plate that was inclined. And a lot of people got that problem wrong because they didn't have the correct geometry interpretation. So for this one, uh, what are the dimensions of the triangle? Like how tall is the triangle and how wide is the triangle? All right, I'm glad you said that. You got the width right, but not the height. So the vertical component of its height is 110 centimeters. But if we want to know actually like, what is the physical length of that triangle, then we're going to have to do the square root of the sum of the squares. So we would have to say, uh, I wonder if I have this in my, oh, I do. So the dimensions of the triangle would be that uh, it is 95 centimeters wide, but then the length, or I guess we could call it the height, uh, but that, that other parameter, it's uh, 200 is this component, 110 is the uh, vertical component, so the overall length is 100 centimeters. Oh, is it 110? Yeah, 110. 110 centimeters squared plus 200 centimeters squared. And we take the square root of that. And let me just check my calculations because I had it written on my paper wrong. If you'll double check me, I'd appreciate the, the second verification. 110 squared plus 200 squared. Take the square root, 228.25. Okay, so 228.25 centimeters. All right, so now if I have a, a pesky question on the exam that asks you to do something similar, just remember that the dimensions may not be what they appear to be at first glance, especially if it's a front view of an object at an angle, which is, that's what this was. Is, you know, 
when you're looking at something from the front view, like uh, this piece of paper that I'm holding up right now, since I'm holding it at an angle, it appears like it's not very tall. But if I hold it straight up and down, then you can see that actually you know, it's 11 inches tall. Same kind of idea. Part, what's that? Yeah, that would be easy, right? Gee, for that matter, I might as well tell you what the magnitude of the force is. <laughs> All right. Okay, so let's just uh, refresh our memory about buoyancy. The two different ways of calculating the buoyant force, the first way is to look at what are the forces from above compared to what are the forces from beneath. And on a problem like this, uh, that would be easy to do if the barrel was, um, if this was oriented such that the flat part was pointing up and the other flat part was pointing down, then that would be pretty easy. But it's more challenging to look at the difference between the forces above and the forces beneath in the orientation that is shown here because of the curved surface. So, you know, finding the pressure distribution and so on would be maybe uh, the the harder way to do it, the easier way to do it would be just to find the difference, but would be to uh, find the buoyant force by um, the weight of the water displaced. Uh, so in this, I give you the, uh, the barrel diameter and uh, how long it is and how deeply submerged it is. And so what is the buoyant force acting on the barrel? And then will it sink or will it float if it has a mass of 1,600 kilograms? OK, so um, I'm going to pause the recording and give you a moment to calculate. Uh, you need to know the barrel volume. Once you've got the volume, you can calculate the buoyant force. What's the decision criteria for whether it'll sink or whether it will float? Before we pause for a moment to do the calculations, how are we going to know whether it sinks or whether it floats? Good. All right, so we need to compare the buoyant force to the weight. So you're going to have to convert that mass to the weight. So let's say F sub B versus W. So if it, uh, if F sub B is greater than W, then dot, dot, dot. What is the then? If the buoyant force is greater than the weight? Float. Float. Good. And then the opposite would, you know, if F sub B is less than W, then sink. Okay. So let me pause this and give you a few moments to do those calculations. Sometimes you'll get irrelevant information. Actually, when you're a practicing engineer, most of the information you'll get from people will end up being irrelevant. You'll have clients that'll be telling you all sorts of stuff that actually has no effect on the design or no effect on the forces that are in play. So, for instance, here, the fact that it's submerged five meters under the surface, uh, there's the same buoyancy and the same weight if it was submerged five meters as if it was submerged one meter. Um, you know, the, the buoyant force only depends on the volume of water displaced. And so here what we have to do is think about the volume of this barrel is going to be the cross-sectional area of the end multiplied by the length of the barrel, which is 1.8 meters. So you can see where uh, I've calculated the barrel volume to be about 5.65 cubic meters. And then from that, you can get the buoyant force. And the buoyant force, of course, is acting upward. Um, this is just water with no specific temperature that's given. So we use the typical unit weight of 9810 newtons per meter cubed. So um, now the, the question is whether the buoyant force is larger or whether the, the weight of the barrel is larger. Oops. So let's look at that last part, whether it'll sink or whether it will float. Um, to get the weight, we have to multiply the mass by g. 
So it's 15,696 newtons. And since that's less than the buoyant force, which was 55,000 newtons, it'll float because buoyant force is larger than the weight. Um, one other way that we could have considered it would be to compare the density of the barrel to the density of water or the unit weight of the barrel to the unit weight of the water. And if either of those is less than the unit weight of water, then it will float. And so here, what we could do is we could say the unit weight of the barrel is its weight divided by its volume. And since the 2776 newtons per cubic meter is less than 9810 newtons per cubic meter, then that means it will be floating on top. And in fact, the ratio of the unit weight of the barrel to the unit weight of water will tell us when it rises to the surface what percent submerged it will be. We looked at that in a previous example in class last Thursday, how deeply submerged things are. All right, so are there any questions on this one? Are either way those able to be on the surface? Yep, but what you would need to do is you'd need to stay to this statement. You couldn't just do the calculations and then leave me to draw the conclusion. You'd need to say, you know, I calculated the unit weight of the barrel, and since water unit weight is greater than the unit weight of barrel, then it will float. So either way would be fine, but you have to be really explicit about what criteria you use to make the conclusion. Are there other questions? Okay, you have a homework assignment that uh, is similar to this. It's got submerged barrels, in fact. Um, has anybody looked at this homework problem already? All right. Well, let's walk through a couple of the key ideas here just to uh, send you headed down the right track. Uh, first of all, the dimensions. What they're saying is that there are four of these submerged barrels. And it only looks like there are two because this is a side view. In actuality, there are four of them. And uh, the information that they give is that this platform, the superstructure that's above the water, has a weight of 30 kilonewtons. And these barrels that are submerged have a diameter of one meter. So keep that in mind that when you're actually calculating the submerged volume, it's going to be the cross-sectional area of the barrel multiplied by whatever length is submerged. Now this is where we have to be careful is that there's a length parameter, but this length parameter L isn't talking about the submerged depth of the barrels. The submerged depth is L minus 1. So keep that in mind, that how much is below the water surface is different than L. All right, so they're asking you, what is the L that would keep this in equilibrium? And so you have to do a force balance. In the, vertical, uh, in, the, in the vertical, the forces are going to be equal to zero. And so the forces that are acting upward are going to be the buoyant forces. And the forces that are acting downward is the 30 kilonewtons of the platform. And then I think, uh, oh yeah, one kilonewton per meter of length for the barrels. And there's four of them. So what you'll need is you'll need an equation that says, what is F sub B as a function of, of L? And then what is the weight as a function of L? Because in the end, F sub B is going to equal weight. So F oh, geez. All right. Uh, F sub B will equal W in this problem. So what you need to do is write equation for F sub B, the buoyant force, as a function of this unknown L. And then also write an equation for the weight as a function of L. And then set them equal to each other. And the only thing that's going to be unknown is L. But then keep in mind that the top view of this platform would look like this. There's four corners to the superstructure. And at each of the four corners is the barrel. So if we're talking about the, the weight of it, the weight is going to be 30 kilonewtons plus four times one kilonewton per length. Uh, whereas the buoyant force, there's going to be you know, the cross-sectional area 
whatever this submerged depth is times four, and that'll give you the, the complete overall submerged volume, and then multiply it by gamma to, to convert it from submerged volume into the buoyant force. I don't want to give too many more hints beside that, but I just did want to reiterate that L is not the submerged length. To get the submerged length, you take L and subtract 1. Yeah? Mm, I don't remember like what the full problem statement was in the book. I think uh, anybody have the book handy? Does it say square in plan view? Yeah. I uh huh. Right. Yeah. I think that you have to kind of like make the leap. They don't tell you explicitly for this one, but. Um, for it to be square, then it would have to be 10 meters in this direction and then 10 meters in the other as well. Have you got it there? Let's see. Thank you very much. Uh, supported a, each corner by a hollow sealed cylinder one meter in diameter. Square and plan view. So, and there's subtle hints. It's, it definitely, it could be more clear than it is. That's why I'm giving you the hints. Yeah, all right. Other questions about this one? I like this problem. It's not my favorite, but I like it. <laughs> All right. All right, let's look at some pictures here. I took a class one time when I was, I, it was like a technical elective I took as a senior. And uh, the professor, he was kind of old. He, he basically he hadn't given up, but he had almost given up. <laughs> and. Uh, for about 80% of the semester, he just showed videos of like water. It's just like, <laughs> it's these EPA videos that were talking in like a really smooth, calm voice, and it would show like mountain streams and like just trickling water. And like they were talking like ostensibly about water quality, but it was just like soothing meditation videos, really. And he just sort of sit there a little drowsy, and we'd watch these videos about water quality. So this is my equivalent of that. We're, we're just looking at a nice picture of water for a moment. Um, oops, all right. So it's a sailboat. Um, why isn't it tipping over? Obviously, there's wind. The wind is blowing. So it's, it's leaning over. But why doesn't it go all the way over? OK. All right, yeah, there's something under. You get a hint of it. There's something down there that we don't necessarily see. I mean, it seems awfully top-heavy just by looking at it, right? If you don't know specifically how uh, boats are constructed, you'd think, man, all of that weight is above the water surface, and then you've got a mast that's going meters and meters into the sky. Is the only thing that keeps it from tipping over just the fact that they're sitting on the edge there? I mean, that probably doesn't hurt, but I don't think that's the main effect. Something else is going on. Uh, there's a really heavy ballast down below the water surface that's kind of uh, making sure that it doesn't tip over. What we're going to talk about today is how you can calculate in advance whether a floating body is stable or whether it's unstable and is at risk of tipping. So it kind of addresses what the uncertainty that's posed by an image like this. You know, is it going to tip over? So here's a, uh, a submarine, which is long and cylindrical. And um, you know, the cross section of it is circular. And here is kind of not a submarine. It's a, like a floating log. And I think this is like probably at some sort of a, like a Ace Adventures type place, you know. Has anybody been over to Ace Adventures out in Fayetteville? They have all sorts of things to play on in the water. So this kid is trying to uh, stay up on top of it. So how come the sailors aren't struggling with the same issue? You know, they're the same shape. They're both floating. They both have people on top. So there's something about that submarine that makes it so that you know, the submarine isn't constantly tipping over. That <laughs> our nation's defense would be a little bit different if the submarines were just always floating all over the place, but they figured it out. Um, 
Part of it is because there is a weight at the bottom, and so it makes it naturally buoyant. Uh, I'm sorry, naturally stable. Uh, the two things that are indicated on the image there is the center of buoyancy, C, and the center of gravity, G. So what determines the center of buoyancy is the shape. It's just the, uh, the water that's being displaced. But the center of gravity is independent of the exterior shape, but rather it is determined by um, where the weight inside of the outside shape is placed. So you'll notice here, there's like that heavy weight at the bottom of it. And so that brings like the average center of weight below the center of the circle because there's so much extra mass down here that brings the average of the weight a little bit lower than the center of buoyancy. The center of buoyancy is just dictated by the outside shape. And so we could have, uh, we could have made this weight down here any shape we wanted and the center of buoyancy wouldn't change. We could put half of it below and half above and C wouldn't change. But if we put half below and half above, then G would go back up to the center of area for that circle. Okay, so center of buoyancy, center of gravity. Now, it's stable because if we tried to twist it, what would happen? That weight would just sink back down to the bottom. If you roll it over, it will right itself. Um, now, consider these other two cases. So, in the case of B, if you twisted it, there wouldn't be any tendency for it to right itself because the center of buoyancy and the center of gravity are in the same place. And so if we go back to the picture of the boy standing on the log, the center of gravity and the center of buoyancy are in the same spot for that log. So there's nothing to keep the bottom always below the surface, whereas in the case of the submarine, they've been very careful in where they put the ballast to try and make it so that there's a natural tendency for it to right itself. Now, consider this, uh, this image here. What's going to happen? Um, this is just temporarily, it looks like this. But when it comes into equilibrium, what's going to happen is that G is going to continue to go down until it's below the center of buoyancy. And so what we have there is what's called a writing couple. R-I-G-H-T-I-N-G, -I -I a writing couple, which means it's going to uh, it's going to write itself back into equilibrium. And a couple means that the, think of it if this was a piece of paper and I put one finger at C and another finger at G and then I pushed in the direction of the arrows. Take a piece of paper and do that. You know, consider this is, you know, it's twisted like that and so I put my fingers in the two spots and I push up at C and down at G. It twists it and then I'm still going to push in those directions. I'm still pushing in those directions, but now since I'm pushing up and pushing down in the same plane, it stops twisting. So that's what happened, is it comes back into equilibrium because of that writing couple. Now consider this is a little bit more sophisticated shape than just the circle we were looking at a few minutes ago. Of course, this was stable for sure, because the center of gravity was below the center of buoyancy. But actually, there are situations where the center of gravity can be above the center of buoyancy and it will still be stable. And so that's what this next one illustrates, is that here we have the center of buoyancy at C and we have the center of gravity at G, but this is still ultimately going to be stable in spite of that fact. And we'll have to step through a couple of illustrations to show why. Now just remember, that the buoyant forces go up and the gravitational forces go down. So it, let's consider what happens if the ship tips over. So the, the ship tips over slightly. Now there's a different uh, area that's under the water surface. Before, what was under the water surface was just everything below this dashed line. So now if the ship tips over a little bit, now, the, the area that's beneath the water surface is B-O-E. 
And so that's just the line that describes what's underneath the water surface. Now, the center of gravity didn't change when it tipped over, but the center of buoyancy did shift. You'll notice here now C is shifted to the right. In the, in the first graph, the, one on the, the first picture on the left, the center of buoyancy was in the middle, but now the center of buoyancy is over a little bit. Can anybody explain why that is? Why did the center of buoyancy shift to the right? Is that starting to shift point B back upward? What's that? Is that starting to shift point B upward? It, yeah, that would be the effect, but that's not the reason why. So it's a little bit backwards. Um, C moved sideways, and that will cause D to come back up, but it's not why shift, that C shifted to the right. Okay, so what he's just noticed is that there's more area beneath the waterline on the right side. Like, this part is lower. The right side of the keel, the right side of the keel is lower than the left side of the keel. So that means that the pressure forces on this side are going to be higher. And so if we take the average of all of those forces across the bottom of the boat, more of those forces are on the right side than on the left side. So that shifts the center of buoyancy to the right. And so naturally, whenever the ship turns to the right side, those buoyant forces are greater on that side. And so now think again about the riding couple. You know, take your fingers on this shape and push down with G and up with C. So that riding couple is just going to push it back into equilibrium until it's straight up and down again. Um, now, there's another thing that we need to observe in this sketch on the right is this thing M. M is the metacenter, and that is the point that the uh, buoyant force is pointing towards. So if we continued to tip this even more, so if, if we tipped the ship a little bit more, C would move further to the right. But the direction of that arrow would always be pointing towards M. So we could tip it to the left, tip it to the right, keep tipping it side to side. Now C would be shifting, but it would always be pointing towards a central axis. And so M, the meta center, is the point of intersection for all of the lines of action for the buoyant force. So the lines point upward from C, which is the center of buoyancy, towards the metacenter. So the ship is stable, even though the uh, center of gravity is higher than the center of buoyancy. What we have to do is we have to ask whether the metacenter is above the center of gravity. So GM, that distance GM, ends up being really important for us. So ships are designed not to tip over. That's why you can have a really large container ship that seems like it would be top heavy, but because of all of the ballast they put at the bottom of the ship, then that can allow it to be stable. And also, it's not just the ballast, it's also the, uh, the shape of the hull has to be such a way that the center of buoyancy can move when the ship tips. So the criteria for knowing whether or not the ship is stable is comparing where is the metacenter and where is the center of gravity. So if the metacenter is above the center of gravity, then the object is stable. But if the metacenter M is below G, then it won't be stable. If G is above M, then it'll tip over. Now, you remember area moment of inertia. We used this formula when we were doing the hydrostatic forces on submerged flat planes. Um, we'll have to do uh, mom area moment of inertia formula for ships when we're doing stability of floating bodies. And um, the way it works is that it's going to be the water line that you consider for A and B. 
And so it's not the, uh, the front view that you'd use for determining A and B, but it is the, uh, the water line. And what you use for B is always the shortest dimension, and what you use for A will be the longest dimension. So in this case, we have a barge that appears to be longer than it is wide. And so we're going to cube B. So you cube the smallest dimension about the water line. And then A, where you're just taking it to the first power, is the longer dimension above the water line. And the reason why we have that area moment of inertia formula is that you can calculate the metacentric height with I divided by V, where V is the submerged volume, minus the distance between C and G. And so if GM is positive, then it's stable, and that means it can tip, and then it will just write itself. But if GM is negative, then that means it's unstable, and uh, it won't be able to write itself with a writing couple. So think about, for a ship, what are some things that can make a ship more stable? So if GM being positive means it's stable, that means you want to maximize I, minimize V, and have a small C sub G. All of those things will give you a big GM. So a big I sub V means that if you have a really wide object, like going back to this barge, what would make this barge even more stable and less likely to tip over if it was wider and if it was longer? You know, the wider and the longer it is, that's going to increase the area moment of inertia. But think about if you've ever been in a boat that was tipsy, like a canoe. The reason why a canoe is prone to tipping over is because it's so narrow. So it doesn't have a very big area moment of inertia compared to the submerged volume. But um, a boat that is more wide, like a paddle boat that you sit down side to side with someone, because that has a, a greater width, then that promotes more stability. OK, I have an in-class exercise that I'm going to hand out. And going through this process, I've broken it up into an A through H. And the reason why there's so many steps is that uh, I want you to figure out how to do these stability calculations one piece at a time. And I've kind of given you the order where there, it's just a clue. The next thing that you need to do is based on the values from the previous one. OK, so this one, it's a barge. So remember, the area moment of inertia is not the side view of the barge. The area moment of inertia is considering the top view of the barge. So when you get to the point where you're doing I, a is the uh, long parameter, and B is the short parameter. If we go back to this other barge, so B is the shorter dimension, A is the longer dimension, and it's the top view dimensions rather than the front view dimensions. Uh, what we have is a load that's piled up over the lip of the barge, and so that means that the center of gravity is right at the top edge. Now, although the barge is 2.44 meters tall, that's not the submerged height. So you'll have to figure out what is D. But uh, the first step here is to calculate the weight of the barge and the load together based on the mass that I've given you. All right, so I'm going to stop talking, give you some time to work on this, collaborate with your classmates, and then we'll go through the calculations together in just a few minutes.
Okay, so on this one, what you have to do is some of it is like dimensions and physical measurements, and then some of it is calculations. So the first thing is just converting the given mass to a weight. And the reason for that is that we know that when it's in equilibrium, the buoyant force and the weight are equal. So that's how we find the F sub B is just saying it's equal to the weight. And uh, how much weight is in that barge is going to dictate how deeply submerged it is. And if you've ever watched the Ohio River, those barges that float up and down, sometimes uh, they're really deeply submerged. Sometimes it looks like uh, they're sticking out of the water quite a lot because they don't have much in there. In this case, we're going to say that the buoyant force is equal to the gamma of the water multiplied by the volume displaced. And since the length and the width of the barge are fixed at 6 and 15.25 meters, and that means it's just the, the D parameter, which is how deeply submerged it is, that varies depending on the weight of the barge. So we calculate how deeply submerged it is, 1.978 meters. And uh, now you'll see that in my side view of the barge, I've said 1.978 is how deeply submerged it is. And so therefore, that means there's 0.462 meters above the water line. And then I've also um, dimensioned out from the water line down to C. And C is halfway between uh, the water line and the bottom edge of the barge. So C is the center of buoyancy. And vertically speaking, it's just going to be in the middle of those two points. So I'm going to have a physical measurement that is CG. It's going to be the total distance between the center of buoyancy and the center of gravity. Now, it's just for calculational simplicity that here they've said that the center of gravity is at the top edge of the barge. It won't always be quite that simple. But for this first illustration, the first time you're calculating uh, where is the center of uh, gravity, they put it at that top edge just to make it easier to calculate the distance. OK, so when calculating the area moment of inertia, remember that what we're cubing is the smaller of the two dimensions. So 6 meters gets cubed, then multiplied by 5.25 meters, divided by 12. So we get the area moment of inertia, which is going to go into this GM formula. But then one other point to emphasize is that V, the, the volume that it's talking about, is just the submerged volume. So uh, when it comes to the stability, the barge could have been much, much taller, and it wouldn't necessarily have a direct impact on stability if it didn't change the center of, gra center of gravity. Uh, so it's just V, the, the volume underneath the water surface that we have to calculate. And that's why I've done that V sub D calculation off on the side where it's the the width, the length, and then the submerged depth that we found previously. So since GM is positive, when we do that calculation, then that means it's stable. It's not going to tip over and sink. It's stable. Um, but then what is GM? Like it's a physical measurement of something. Um, and the units of GM is meters. I should have written meters there um, because it's Meters to the fourth divided by meters. So that's going to leave us with meters in this first parameter. And we're subtracting meters. So this is 0 0.0657 meters. So what that means is it's a distance between G and M. Remember, M is metacenter. And if we go back to this, G is below the metacenter. So M is 
somewhere up here in the rocks. If we go back to the um, diagram from before, when we were tipping this thing over, the metacenter was the point that all of the center of um, buoyancies point towards. As it tips, then the, the M is that central axis that all of the center of buoyancy vectors point towards. And so if we go back to the example you've just worked, what it means is that if we started to tip this over, we could see how the center of buoyancy would shift to the right if, if the barge started to tip. The center of buoyancy would go to the right, and the direction of that vector would be going up towards some metacenter. So the metacenter right now is above the center of, um, center of mass. But if we put more rocks in, think about what would happen if we put even more rocks in there. What it would do is it would sit lower in the water. And so if we put more rocks in, then that would mean that the uh, CG distance would get larger. Right? CG would get bigger because by putting in more rocks, that would take the center of uh, center of gravity higher, and then it would also be more deeply submerged, and so C would go lower. So by putting in more rocks, that would make CG bigger, and then that would also increase V, the volume underneath the water surface. I would be held constant. I wouldn't be affected by us putting in more rocks. But by putting in more rocks, we'd be making it less stable. So there would be a greater potential for it to tip if we put in those more rocks. So it's pretty close to the edge of uh, instability, but what we could do is you could calculate how much more mass could it take before it becomes unstable. I don't think any of your homework problems ask you to do that, but what you could do is you could solve for gm is equal to zero, and then back calculate. That sounds like a good exam question. I've never thought about that before, but I won't give you that exam question for Thursday. I won't tell you what is on the exam, but I will tell you we won't have one where you have to uh, find how, what's the maximum buoyancy. OK, uh, any questions on the example? We're going to do something very similar to this in the lab. We actually have a pretty good setup for playing around with metacentric height. So I don't remember if we do that uh, tomorrow. I'd have to look at the lab schedule. but. If not tomorrow, it'll be really soon. All right, so Thursday's the big day. We've got a homework assignment due. We'll have our exam. If you have any questions about the homework or as you're studying for the test, anything you want to double check with, feel free to stop by my office or send me an email. That's all for today. I'll see you on Thursday.